Hi, this is Pastor Darrell Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Tuesday, October 24th, 2017. This channel, in case you don't know, is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what I talk about. Pretty much falls under one of those headings, everything you're going to hear on this channel. World news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Out of world Israel news, report said Israeli airstrike kills 10 ISIS terrorists in Syria. You know, Iran has been warning Israel, hey, don't, don't come into Syria, don't fly over Syrian airspace. Israeli Air Force reportedly carried out an airstrike against an ISIS affiliate in Syria, killing at least 10 ISIS fighters. So, uh, I'm not going to read all the stories and all the information in each story today, but this is pretty big because Israel is basically saying, look, you attack us because... Syria launched a rocket into Israel, and Israel said, hey, this rocket was intentional. This wasn't some kind of errant misfire somewhere. This was an intentional strike. IAF airstrikes on Syrian targets, primarily against weapons shipments from Iran, en route for Hezbollah in Lebanon, have been reported very recently. Of course, Israel has vowed to operate to ensure the country's security interests are maintained, Israel is telling Iran, hey, we're not afraid of you. If we see something that threatens our country, we're going to take it out. We know that Iran, which is Persia in the Bible, we know they lead a world army against Israel. Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39. Interesting story out of Gatestone. Gatestoneinstitute.org. Headline says, the Iran-Hamas plan to destroy Israel. Iran's goal? For Hamas to maintain and enhance its preparation for war against Israel. Iran's message to Hamas, if you want us to continue providing you with financial and military aid, you must continue to hold on to your weapons and reject demands to disarm. Iran wants Hamas to retain its security control over the Gaza Strip so the Iranians can hold on to another power base in the Middle East, as it does with Hezbollah and Lebanon. Iran, Persia, seeking to destroy Israel. How many times in the news have we heard leaders in Iran chanting, death to Israel, destroy Israel, death to America. They, they don't like anything democratic. They don't like anything that acknowledges the one true God. Hmm. Iran is stepping up. Iran has been saying, oh, we're stronger in our region now more than ever. We're a greater influence in the Middle East than we've ever been before. Huh. Well, what's that old saying? Pride comes before the fall? How close, Lord? How close? Is anyone else just seeing everything? that lines up with Bible prophecy? Are you having dreams and visions? Are you feeling in your spirit, in your heart, that the days are drawing short? The time is at hand. Very interesting times we live in. Out of Israel, Hayom, report says Iran president slams corrupt revolutionary guard. So a month or two ago, President Trump was saying Iran's Revolutionary Guard is to be deemed a terrorist organization. They're corrupt. They're terrorists. They seek nothing for others, only things for themselves. And of course, he was slammed by everyone. Everyone. The media. Of course, Iran. But now, the president of Iran is coming out saying... The Revolutionary Guard is corrupt. Hassan Rouhani targets powerful Revolutionary Guard Corps over their tight grip on the country's economy, perceived as a threat in the post-nuclear deal era. 
Criticism is reportedly backed by Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khomeini. Hmm. Saying the Revolutionary Guard Corps is corrupt and prevent free competition in Iran, thereby curbing its economic recovery after years of crippling Western sanctions imposed over Iran's nuclear program. Rouhani is a moderate reformist. Both of his campaigns focused on economic prosperity, and he's been able to achieve most, most of his goals since signing a nuclear agreement with world powers in 2015. But now he's turned his attention to the Revolutionary Guards, which control entire sectors of Iran's economy. He said we must have free competition. No institution can use its authority to derive a benefit. We must be open and fair. There can be no exclusivity in one, any one sector. Hmm. The Revolutionary Guard Corps have dominated government construction companies and other corporations for decades, operating without supervision. Interesting. Trump spoke it a couple of months ago. Now the leaders in Iran finally see what he's talking about. Interesting story out of Scout.com says the one big reason no nation would wage a war on Israel. In a private email leaked to the public in September of 2016, former Secretary of State and retired U.S. Army General Colin Powell alluded to Israel having an arsenal of 200 nuclear weapons. Now this number might be an exaggeration, but there is no doubt that Israel does have a small but very powerful nuclear stockpile spread out among its armed forces. Israeli nuclear weapons guard against everything from defeat in conventional warfare to serving to deter hostile states from launching nuclear, chemical, and biological warfare attacks against the tiny country. No matter, the goal is the same, to prevent the destruction of the Jewish state. No one wants to go to war with Israel. It's pretty well known Israel does have a number of nukes. I don't know if it's 200 or not. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. But, I mean, honestly, wouldn't two or three be enough to deter somebody? I mean, if Russia said, you know what, we're going to come after you, Israel, and Israel lobbed a couple into Moscow and, you know, some other parts of Russia, wouldn't that be enough? I mean, does it really take 200? 200 nuclear weapons could just about wipe out the planet. Hit some of the largest targets in the world and could cause a lot of damage with 200 nukes. Hmm. I find it rather fascinating how God speaks of destroying the world with fire next time. And even the fact that in the Old Testament, Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, he spoke of something that sounds very much like a nuclear bomb. In Zechariah 14, verse 12, And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Their flesh is going to fall off their bones while they're standing. That's what nuclear bombs do. It disintegrates human flesh instantly. That scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark where they kind of melt away while they're standing, it's almost exactly what Zechariah describes. Hmm. Sign of the times looks to me like out of alarabia.net, ISIS executed a 128 in revenge campaign in Syrian town. I don't even know how to pronounce this. Karitain. ISIS killed 128 people that it's suspected of collaborating with the Syrian regime. Right before losing this desert town to government forces. ISIS has, over a period of 20 days, executed more than 116 civilians. Death toll is at 128. Just 
executing them, killing them, thinking, oh, well, you're against us, boom, dead. Out of Prophecy News Watch, headline says, Millennials abandon belief in God for belief in everything else. Doesn't God's word tell us this? I mean, Paul is very clear. In 2 Timothy, very clear, where he's talking about, you know what help I actually got to 2 Timothy. <laughs> um, of course, in, in 2 Timothy 3, perilous times shall come, men will be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, truce breakers, despisers of those that are good, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. But in 2 Timothy 4, we read how in verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Millennials abandoning belief in God for belief in everything else. Saying they're turning to witchcraft, astrology, all kinds of things. Believing in anything but the truth. Hmm. It's where we are, people. It's where we are on a biblical timeline. It's where we are right now on this planet in America. Everyone's striving for money. You know, everyone seems to want fame and fortune and wealth and everything you could possibly think of that comes along with that. You know, you, you hear people say things like, oh, he who dies with the most toys wins. You know what? I've never seen a U-Haul behind the hearse. You can't take it with you. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, Starting in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust corrupts, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where's your treasure today? You know, we... We read yesterday about the, the widow who gave all that she had in the, the treasury, into the offering plate, if you will. She gave all that she had in this world to the temple's treasury. You ever wondered how she could do something like this? She, she gave her, her very last penny to the kingdom. She gave it all. She gave all. I've never done that. I've never said, here's everything I have. Take it, Lord. In, in regards to finances, I've tried to do that daily with all that I have right here. Saying, here am I, Lord. Take me, use me. I submit myself to you for your kingdom. But she gave all because she could look beyond her earthly existence. As small and minimal as it was, she knew there was a city of gold. She knew her treasure treasure wasn't in this world, but in the next. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. You know, the way you use money completely reveals whether your hope is in the here and now, in earthly possessions, or in heaven. I mean, sure, don't misunderstand. We need a place to live. Okay, so mortgage or a rent payment is, is pretty obvious. You probably need something to get back and forth to work. Car, you know, you, you tend to have to buy those unless you're one of these people that got a free one. <laughs> never had a free car. I've never had anyone buy me a car. I've had dozens of cars in my lifetime. Bought them all. I think I had one hand-me-down uh, that I got to use when my family bought a new car. Um, 
But we need things. We need food. We need water. We need to survive, right? And money helps us do that. But do you use your money for earthly possessions? I mean, your money in this life either works for the kingdom of God or it controls you. So determining how to use your money will show pretty much where your treasure is. You know, I think we should use our finances to serve God's purposes now. Put it to work so you can win lost souls to the kingdom. So you can send missionaries where they're needed in other parts of the world where they need to hear the gospel. To build the church, to feed the poor, the orphans, the widows, to help those who can't help themselves. We need to give with faith to the priorities of heaven and trust God to meet our needs. So your money either works for the kingdom of God or it controls you here on earth. What's your money doing right now? Are you giving to God? Are you trying to advance the kingdom? In 2 Timothy 4, verse 16. 2 Timothy 4, verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, may not be charged against them. The Bible tells us in um, Psalm 118, verse 8, it is better to put your trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. You know, you can, you can look to people to encourage you and comfort you, but I have to say that a lot of times you're going to be disappointed. I mean... Yes, people do help at times. People will encourage you. People will stand with you. And God will work through all kinds of people to do a lot of things for you. And I understand how some people can look on the rich and famous and the powerful and the incredibly beautiful people and think, I want to be like them or I want to have what they have. But if you think about it, I'd rather be in one of the worst places imaginable with the Lord than in the greatest place imaginable without him. Does that make sense to anybody? Um, I mean, if everyone forsook Jesus, he was enough for me. If everyone despised Jesus, I'd rather be with him than the most famous person on earth. You don't read about these Christians coming to Paul's aid, right? They didn't. In fact, there were a lot of times when people let Paul down too. You've been there, right? We've all been there when we thought we had a friend and, oh, you know, they didn't show up. Oh, I'm moving next week. I need some help. Oh, yeah, I'll be there. And they, they fail to show up, right? Or when you really need a friend to come help you with something and they let you down. Or you're going through a really difficult time and you call somebody to kind of lean on their shoulder and cry a little bit and they aren't there for you, right? Ever been there? Um, ever felt like people just completely abandon you? Sometimes we even falsely think that God has let us down. But God doesn't do that. In Hebrews, Hebrews 11 uh, verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God said, I won't leave you alone. I won't leave you comfortless. I'll never forsake you. God doesn't let us down. Don't look to people for answers. Look to God. You know, ultimately it comes down to God is with you even if others aren't. So you can always be certain that God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's how David was able to get through some of his valleys. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23, verse 4. He knew God was there. God can compensate for everything you lose on planet Earth, whether it's finances, possessions, friends, 
God will never leave you, never forsake you. In 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 12, you can read about David. You know, the Philistine army was, was ready to uh, take on the whole army. Here's this boy David going from his home to the to the battleground in order to check on his brother and make sure they, they had food. And when he heard Goliath threatening Israel, David was outraged. He's like, who's this giant to challenge the Lord's army? I've been in the valley where they say David killed Goliath. And as you're standing there looking and you you see the scene, you can almost envision it. You know, we've all read the story dozens of times, even hundreds in some cases. But it didn't quite come to life for me until I was actually there looking at it and thinking, okay, that makes sense. You can almost see the Philistines army over here and the Israelites over there and trying to imagine, you know, wonder where exactly the spot was where Goliath fell. <sighs> David, he, he heard God's direction. He, he obeyed God. You know, this battle happened between this giant and this boy, but Almighty God was with David. He didn't forsake him. He didn't leave him. Goliath was defeated along with the entire Philistine army. It's an amazing story. You know, we don't hear of these kind of miraculous stories in our world today, it seems. But just like David, we can live in victory. We can live triumphantly, even in the midst of some of the most scary circumstances. We need to understand success from God's perspective. You know, goals should align with Scripture. And then, as our Father directs us, we, we follow with confidence. And then, like David, we have to have this clear picture of what needs to be accomplished. You know, goals should be clear enough to write in a, a couple of sentences. I mean, David's aim was to free God's people from their enemies. Our goals might be bigger. They might be more lifelong. You know, wanting to make sure our children know Christ. Or others might be a little simpler, like having a weekly family night or a movie night or, you know, something like that. So no matter what you're facing, we need to live with intention and have goals. Ask God to give you direction and purpose and then contemplate your goals, whether they're big or small. The same God who led David into victory wants to lead you also. Are you willing to obey? Are you willing to follow? You know, it's not the works that save. Works don't save you. Um... In Mark eleven sixteen, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. You know, Mark points out that Jesus wouldn't let anyone carry any vessel through the temple. Um, and it doesn't really give us an explanation as to why Jesus doesn't allow this. I mean, maybe Jesus didn't want his father's house to be dedicated. Uh, he wanted it to be completely dedicated to prayer and the ministry of God, not to be doing any work in there. Um... Not for certain, but, you know, there was the time Jesus overturned the tables and said, my father's house, a house of prayer, you've made it a den of robbers. Um, I think kind of the same way with the Sabbath. You know, work symbolizes our own effort. Our own effort will always fall short of what God demands for salvation. Anything that resembles work was probably inappropriate in the house of God. Um, Bible tells us it is faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of works. I mean, what are the works of the law? You know, any, any command or law that a person observes in an attempt to be accepted in a right standing with God is a work of the law. I mean, works of the law is a righteousness produced by oneself, a righteousness belonging to oneself, offered to God as a means of meeting God's standard for acceptance. So someone thinking, oh, well, if I, if I follow all these pillars, or if I do all these things, 
then I'll have a right standing with God. He'll look upon me with favor and I'll be righteous and I'll be, I'll be saved. I think it takes a pretty radical revelation of the gospel of grace to abandon faith in the works of the law. God's standard of righteousness is the righteousness of God only. God designed salvation in a way so as to eliminate anyone being able to boast, saying, well, I, I did this and I did that and I saved myself. <laughs> no, you didn't. Um, if salvation was by works alone or even partially, oh, well, if you do this and this and this and then you believe this, you'll be saved. So people could say, well, I did that, that and that, so I'm saved it's because of me. No, it's all because of Christ. It's only because of what Christ did on the cross that we have everlasting salvation. I mean, grace and faith eliminate man's ability to boast altogether. Faith towards God and what he's done through Christ Jesus on the cross is the only means of receiving his free gift of salvation. Salvation by grace brings praise and glory to God. I mean, if we could save ourselves, either partly or completely, we would take credit for it. You know we would. That's not the case. Because all the glory goes to God. It all belongs to God. No one's going to be able to, to brag in heaven, well, I did this and I did that and I saved myself. Nobody saved themselves. Nobody saved anyone else other than Christ. Me leading someone to the cross of Christ isn't me saving them. It's me leading them to the one who can save them. Big difference. I don't save anybody. I don't want anyone to follow me. I want people to follow Christ. It's not about me. <laughs> I'm just a, a voice in the wilderness crying out about the one who can save you. It's what we do. It's what we're called to do. Encourage each other. Strengthen each other. Sharpen each other. Because guess what, people? There's coming a time on planet Earth when things are going to get seriously chaotic. To the point where a lot of people won't know where to turn. Don't turn to me. Don't turn to someone else. Don't turn to presidents or kings or prime ministers. Turn to Christ. He's the only name under heaven by which you must be saved. And I will gladly boast of him and him only. I have nothing I can boast about. But I will boast of my Lord. Because he loves me. He'll never forsake me, and he died to save me. Do you know him? Do you trust him? I hope and pray that you do. God bless you. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again tomorrow.